Hi guys. This is a vlog. Today I will study some topics in our building technology subject. I'll also discuss it to you for now I'm learn while watching my vlog. The first part is about the preparation for construction. Staking out the building. Staking out. So what do you mean by staking out? Staking out is the process of relocating the point of boundaries and property line of the site where the building is to be constructed. You can pause and read the slide for more description. Next is laying the batterboards. Batterboards are horizontal boards that establishes the height of the footing trenches and foundations. They also establish the height of finished floor levels. Leveling. Leveling is done with a line level or carpenter's level or with a transit. The height of the batterboards may be level with or a little higher than the top of the finished foundation. Here are a few important notes or terms that you need to know. First is the spirit level. It is an instrument or tool capable of vertical and horizontal line checks. The second one is a plumb bob. It is a weight attached to a string used for vertical line check. Third one is plastic hose filled with water, a method of leveling horizontally batter boards without transit. Lastly, we have the three, four, five multiples with the use of steel tape measure. It is a manual method of squaring the corners of building lines in Hello everyone, I am Finch and today let's talk about formwork and showing. So first off, what is a formwork? A formwork is used to shape and support fresh concrete until cured and able to support itself. Formwork is temporary or permanent molds into which concrete or similar materials are poured. In the context of concrete construction, the formwork supports the shattering molds. Now, what is shoring? Shoring is a temporary support designed to carry forms for beams and slabs. Shoring, form of prop or support, usually temporary, that is used during the repair or original construction of buildings and in excavations. Temporary support may be required, for example, to relieve the load of, on a masonry wall while it is repaired or being reinforced. When creating forms in concrete construction, we can use different types of materials. So first, we have lumber, second, plywood, third, steel, fourth is fiber boards, and fifth is phenolic boards. Timber is a great example of materials that is strong and flexible enough to, re to relatively lightweight and yet rigid enough that the concrete forms will keep the same shape, allowing the concrete to set in the desired form. Similar to the plywood which is virtually any exterior type APA panel that can be used for concrete formwork because all such panels are manufactured with moist resistant adhesive. For concrete forming, the plywood industry produces a special product called plyform which is good for uh, formworks. Steel on the other hand is a regularly used in heavy civil construction to create thin steel plates which can be held together with clamps or with fasteners to support broad concrete projects. Fiberboard offers longer panels that have proven to offer superior consistency when building seamless curved forms. And phenolic boards which are usually used as part of the formwork system for beams, slabs, RC walls, columns, and sometimes as makeshift table at an office site. Phenolic boards are made up of wooden sheets that are glued together using phenol formaldehyde, hence the name. And these are the points that must be taken when using lumber forms and shoring. First, it must be partially seasoned and to some extent slightly wet in order to prevent swelling and distortion of, of the forms. It must be dressed at least one side and both edges even for non-exposed surfaces. The joints in form for columned beams and girders made tight by dress dressing the lumber through to edge, forming square or butt joints. 
tight joints in floor and wall panels obtained by using tongue and groove stock. The sizes of the lumber used are 2 inches stock for columns, beams and girder bottoms 1 inches stock for floor plan panels, and beam and girder sides 2 by 4 for struts. Post shores and uprights 1 or 2 inches stock for cleats. Crude oil and petroleum used to prevent concrete form adhering to the wood and preserve the form against damage by alternate wetting and drying. On, form, on forms against the surface which are plastered, wetting with water will be sufficient since oil prevents adhe adhesion of the plaster. Wire ties or bolts and rods are used to hold wall forms together. Rods preferred and should be arranged that upon removal of the forms. No metal shall be within one inch of any surface. Wire ties should be used only on light and unimportant work where this coloring will not be object objectionable. Plywood form used where a smooth surface is required and should be waterproof grade A and at least one half inches thick. And so this is what shoring looks like. In this illustration, we can see the column forms or wood form works. It is the rectangular prism which will hold the concrete inside until it sets. Wood form works is reusable forms may have square or rectangular cross sections and there we can see yokes. Those are clamping devices for keeping column forms and tops of wall form from spreading under the fluid pressure of newly placed concrete. Here in the illustration, we can see the uh, wall formwork, as its name implies, it is a type of formwork used to construct walls in numerous types of construction applications. Wall formwork can, can be made of, of timber, steel, aluminum, or other materials. And here, a spreader. A spreader, it could be, is a, it could be a vehicle or accessory. It's used for constructing road foundations, spreading materials over surfaces, including aggregates, graded aggregates, cement, concrete, and hot or cold bituminous materials. And here we have the plywood sheeting. It's made, it is made from cross-laminated wood sheets. Plywood sheeting is durable and strong but runs the risk of developing soft spots which can cause structural problems over time. Oriented stand, stand board or OSB is made from wood chips glued together. And here we have the horizontal whalers. A horizon, it is a horizontal reinforcement that, utilize, that utilizes uh, to keep newly poured concrete from bulging outward. And the steel plate is a horizontal reinforcement utilized to keep newly concrete from bulging outward as well. Almost similar to the horizontal whalers. Bracing is a bracing system that serves to stabilize the main girders during construction to contribute to the distribution of load effects and to provide restraint to compression flanges or cords where they would otherwise be free to buckle laterally. And here we have the wood studs. Wood studs are framing elements that support walls. Ensuring we have these form ties. Form ties are, are what holds the shoring together. In this illustration, we can see an example of form, form ties. It has snap ties. Snap ties have notches or crimps that allow their ends to be snapped off below the concrete, concrete surface after stripping of the forms. They have small truncated cones of wood, steel or plastic attached to form ties to space and spread wall forms. Leave a neatly finished depression in the concrete surface to be filled or be left exposed. And here in the illustrations, we can also see she bolts. They consist of wall or rods that are inserted through the forms and threaded onto the end of an inner rod. After stripping the waller, after stripping the waller rods, they are removed from for reuse while the inner rods remain in the concrete. A variety of wedges and slotted devices tighten the formwork and transfers the force 
in a firm tie to the Wallers. I am Lorraine May El Salvan from BSN Architecture Today A4. So now, in this bottle, there are road papers that I will be picking two pieces, one at a time, and let's talk about the topic that is assigned or written on it. So first, what are the major components of metal shoring? First of all, steel forms and shoring. Shoring is also used to support scaffolding works. Scaffolding are temporary platforms designed to support workers and materials on the face of structure and to provide access to work areas above the ground. Any elevated platform is called scaffold. To answer the question, the major components of metal shoring are the ledger or the horizontal brace, the brace of the diagonal, this component may be of the adjustable and the fixed type. The standard or the vertical component and the accessories such as heads, jacks, and bases. So now let's proceed to the second piece of topic. The second one will be how many shoring assembly instructions. How many shoring assembly instructions? There are nine assembly instructions. Number one, ensure the ground and sleepers are adequately prepared and the base, jacks, and standards are in correct positions. Number two, assemble tower of four standards and ledgers, fixed braces, and stabilized. Number three, loosely fit the remaining components until majority of first level complete. Check standards for vertically and tighten ledgers. Number four, position scaffolds, boards, and ladders. Number five, additional ledgers and braces can now be added with additional braces. And number six, once all levels are complete, jacks and heads can now be positioned. Number seven, jack head levels Finalized and any jack brazing required is now fitted. Number eight, primary beams can be positioned, clamped, and levels checked. And lastly, secondary beams can be positioned and clamped to primary beams, plywood decking to follow. Hello everyone, I am Marjoshua M. Ganisares. Construction Tools and Equipment Tools and equipment employed in construction are grouped into four. These are hand tools, power tools, equipment, and heavy equipment. Hand tools are the tools that use power delivered by man only. Power tools are those that employ power supplied by forces other than that coming from humans. Equipment is a term that refers to large, complex tools and machines that is designed to do a particular job. Heavy equipment is equipment which is very large and very powerful. Samples of hand tools A pry bar. It is used to force open boards used in forming concrete. Folding rules and tape measures are the most common tools for measuring boards, pipe, wires, etc. Digital rules is used to measure relatively long distances such as those in highway construction. Framing square is used to measure 90 degree angles at the corners of framework and joints. They can also be employed to determine cutting angles on dimension lumber. A level. Level is a long straight tool that contains one or more vials of liquid and used to determine if the horizontal or vertical is exact. Chalk line or chalk box is used to marking lines. Types of hammers. Claw hammer is an ordinary hammer used to drive or remove nails. Sledge hammer is a heavy hammer used to drive stakes into the ground and to break up stone and concrete. Types of screwdrivers are standard screwdriver, Phillips screwdriver, and spiral ratchet screwdriver. Standard screwdriver has a flat tip and is designed to fit a standard slotted screw. Phillips screwdriver has an X-shaped tip and is used to turn Phillips head screws only. Spiral ratchet screwdriver is that which relies on pushing force rather than a twisting force. Types of hand saws. Rip saw has a chisel-like teeth designed for ripping or cutting with the grain of wood. Crosscut saw is used to cut across the grain of wood. Back saw is a special type of hand saw that has a very thin blade and makes very straight cuts 
such as those on trims and moldings. Hacksaw is used to cut metals. Types of chisels. Wood chisel is used to trim wood and clear away excess material from wood joints, and cold chisel is used to trim metals. Types of specialized hand tools are the following. Nail set is used to drive finishing nails below the surface of the wooden trim or molding. Pipe wrench is used to turn around objects like pipes. Brick trowel is used to place and trim mortar between bricks or concrete blocks. Bull float is used to smoothen out the surface of wet concrete. Line riveter is used to fasten pieces of sheet metal together. Hello! So, in continuation sa itong construction tools and equipment, nako di reaper mag-talk about sa power tools. So, natin ito ka types of power tools. Number one is power drill. It is used to drill sa woods, sa metal, and sa concrete. Ang power screwdriver. Ito itong screw screw. It is used to install and remove screw guns. The screwdriver is used to remove the screws kung like naka-screw bitaw. So, ang another na ko i-add is what are the types of power saws. So, first is ang radial arm saw. Ano siya? Used for cross-cutting wood and consists of motor-driven saw blade that is hung on the arm of a table. Number two is ang table saw. So, ano siya? It is used for cutting large sheets of wood and wood composites and consists of a blade mounted on an electric motor beneath a table-like surface. 3 is a portable circular saw. Ta-da! It is used for cutting materials that are difficult to cut with stationary tools. Number 4 is a power miter saw. It is a circular saw mounted over a small table used to cut various angles in wood. Saber saw. Ano used to cut out curves or holes in floors and roofs for pipes and has a small knife-shaped blade that moves up and down. Power hammers. One is a pneumatic hammer or junk hammer. Ano siya? Yung nakikita doon. Ngunit siya ang ginagamit mga brick sa mga concrete or asphalt, especially sa mga buildings or pavings. Is a rotary hammer. An electric drill that operates with both rotating and reciprocating action and is used to drill holes in concrete. Finally, ang ako iyad sa inyo guys is ang other types of surveying equipments. Number one is transit. It is an equipment used by surveyors to measure horizontal and vertical angles to obtain land elevation. Number two is on surveyor's level. It is used to determine an undefined elevation from an unknown one. It is on construction laser. It flashes a narrow, accurate beam of light to make a baseline for additional measurements and is used as a level or as an alignment tool. Hi guys! So now let's move on to the part 3 of the construction tools and equipment. We have already discussed the hand tools, different power tools, and some of the construction equipment like conveyor and serving equipment. We will now continue our discussion on some other types of equipment that we are using in construction. Types of pump. We will start our discussion with different types of pump. There are two type, There are two different types of pump. One is water pump and con the other one is concrete pump. Water pump is used to pump water out of holes in the ground so that construction work can commence. Water pumps are commonly used on construction sites to remove excess water accum accumulated due to heavy rain or high water table. They primarily serve two purposes, keep water out of foundation tunnels, and the other is ex excavation pits, and provide a supply of water for other purposes. And the other one is concrete pump. Concrete pump is used to move concrete from the concrete mixer to the concrete form. It transfers freshly mixed liquid concrete to the location on the construction site where it is needed. It works using a valve system and the basic principle of hydraulics. So, asa man lugar na siya gikan, di ba? Unsa owner siya pag make? So, diri na siya. Sa concrete mixer cement. Concrete mixer cement, a machine that mixes concrete ingredients by means of rotating drum. Raw materials are introduced into the mixing drum through its open and in discharge by tilting the mixing drum to allow the concrete to pour out. So, mo to siya, kung makita ito ninyo, 
Ang isa kay pwede masakay, ma tapos ang isa kay nasa sa on-site. And there are types of welding machines. There are two types of welding machines. Arc welding machine and laser machine. So first, we'll discuss arc welding machine. So baling mo niya itong ginagamit. Usually, ay, muna siya ang usually nagkakakita. So ang um, arc welding machine is used to weld materials by melting portion of the metal. So asa man siya, asa man ni gagamitin ani. So gagamit ang arc welding machine o welding rod. At the same time ang um, laser welding, wait lang ha. Ako si Ian. Okay. Ang um, laser laser powered welder di ay. Laser powered welder is used to weld materials by employing laser to heat the metal. So ang um, laser powered welder ga use og laser. Ang arc welding machine ga use og welding rod. Next. Um, so, quick summary before we move on. Construction tools and equipment are grouped into four. Hand tools, power tools, equipment, and lastly, the heavy equipment. These are equipment which are large and powerful. Heavy equipment. Bulldozer. Okay. First heavy equipment that we will discuss is the bulldozer. Bulldozer is a tractor with a pushing blade which moves earth and clears land bushes and trees. Next, okay, cranes. Cranes is a tractor with pushing blade which moves earth and clear land bushes and trees. So first, there are three types of cranes. Crawler crane, truck, train, a truck crane, and tower crane. A crawler crane is a, cr uh, is a crane mounted on metal threads so that it can move over rough terrain. Crawler cranes in construction are used when the project requires a heavy load to be lifted over long distances or great heights. While truck crane, truck crane is mounted on a truck frame so that it can be driven in the site. So generally, these cranes are able to travel on highways. That was the crane must not be that heavy to exceed the weight and the payload capacity of the truck. Tower crane or climbing crane is used in the construction um, construction of tall building because it has a built-in jack that raises the crane from floor to floor as the building is constructed. Tower crane surpasses the load, loading and lifting capacity of any other crane. Their height's capacity can't be matched by any other types of crane. They have incredible stability and can be can bear the hardest task. So usually, asa na to ni kita ang tower crane? Diha ni siya sa mga, mga skyscraper na mga buildings. Kaya nila super taas Okay, gagamit ni sila og hydraulic. Next, excavator. Hmm. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Excavator is a machine used for digging or scoping earth from a place and depositing it in another. There are three types of excavator. Backhoe, trencher, and front end loader. Backhoe is used to general a uh, backhoe is used for general digging which is usually mounted on, a, on either a crawler or truck frame. While trencher is a special kind which digs trencher, uh, trenches or log, long narrow ditches for pipelines or cables. So ang trencher, ginagamit ni siya usually sa kanawit na mag-create mag o access, uh, kind of wave or a way para sa mga pipelines. So ang front end loader is a large shoveling machine that, that can scoop or deposit a large amount of material. <clears throat> Next, highway, highway construction equipments. Highway construction equipments. Scraper. Sc um, scraper is a machine that loads holes and dumps soil over medium to long distances. So it is, it is used to dig hole and level out cut and fill or strip off topsoil on variety of construction jobs. They have massive rubber tires and can quickly move large quantities of earth around construction site. So grader, grader is an earthworking machine that grades or levels the ground. The grader's purpose is to finish grade, to refine or set precisely. <clears throat> Graders are commonly used in the construction and maintain, maintenance of dirt and gravel roads for creating a flat surface where the asphalt will be replaced. Oh, will be placed, sorry. Will be placed. Okay. Compactor. Compactor or roller is a machine that compacts soil to prepare for road paving. Road rollers use their weight to compress down the surface of the asphalt, 
The process of compression down can be either static or dynamic. In static compression, the machine is only rolled over the road surface. But in the case of dynamic compression, mechanical means like vibration or vibration are used. And lastly, paver. Paver is a machine that places uh, is a machine that places, spreads, and finishes concrete or asphalt paving material. It is used to lay asphalt on roads, bridges, parking lots, and other such places. It lays the asphalt flat and provides minor com compaction before it is complicate before it is compacted by a roller. So that's all for the construction tools and equipments. So now we will move on to the next topic, which is the major parts of building. Hi, it's me again. Now I'll discuss the major parts of a building. The major parts of a building are the superstructure, the substructure, and the foundation. The superstructure is a portion of the building above the ground. The substructure is the habitable portion of the building found below the ground. And the foundation is the structural portion of the building that transfer the buildings flowed into the soil. So what are the three types of substructures? The first type is the slab on fail. It is a slab which rests on ground and not suspended. Next is the crawl space. In a building without a basement, an unfinished accessible space below the first floor which is usually less than a full story height. The third one is the basement. It is the lower story of a building, either partly or entirely below grade. So let's talk about foundation. What is foundation? In construction, foundations are generally known as structures below a building's column. They are responsible for ensuring the stability of their structures by transferring its weight straight to the ground. Foundations are usually built with conventional construction materials such as concrete, stones, and steel. The word foundation applies to the following. First, construction below grade, such as footing courses, basement walls, etc., forming the lower section of a structure. Second, the natural material, the particular part of the earth's surface on which the construction rests. Third, special constructions such as piling of piers, used to transmit the loads of the building to firm substrata. These are the types of foundations. Foundation wall. A foundation wall is the masonry or concrete wall below the ground level. These walls serve as the main support for a structure of your home. This means that they are extremely important to the overall structure of your home. Foundation piers and columns. In general, it is an upright support for a structure or superstructure, but it can also refer to the section of load-bearing structural walls between openings and different types of columns. Piers are most commonly made of concrete, masonry, or treated timber, and installed into prepared holes or shafts. Grade beam. Grade beam is a part of a foundation system which supports the exterior wall of the superstructure and bears directly on the column footing. Footing courses. Footing courses is the lower portion of walls, piers, or columns, which are spread to provide a safe base. Foundation bed. Foundation bed is the natural material on which the construction rests, and there are different types of foundation beds. Foundation beds may be classified as follows. For site investigation, before any design is made, the architect is required to get as much valuable data about the site excavation and building erection at the project site in order to determine the character of the materials which will be encountered at the level of a foundation bed. And in methods of exploration, there are two methods. Number one, test pits. For shallow work, an open pit is the most suitable method since it calls for an actual inspection of the undisturbed material over a considerable area. Number two, test borings. For excavations that are carried no deeper than the proposed level, the underlying material may be investigated by the test boring. Soil mechanics. There are two broad classes of soil. These are coarse grain soil and fine grain soil. Coarse grain soil consists of relatively large particles visible to the naked eye. Fine grain soil consists of much smaller particles such as silt and clay. Characteristics of soil. In the soil classification in the table, we can see the types of soil, which are the gravels, sands, stills, and clays. And their symbols, description, 
presumptive bearing capacity and permeability and drainage. Safety and strength of soil bed is defined by the following criteria. Allowable bearing capacity is the maximum unit pressure a foundation is permitted to impose vertically or laterally on a soil mass. Density is the critical factor in determining the bearing capacity of granular soil. SPT or standard penetration test measures the density of granular soils and consistency of some clays and records the number of blows required by a hammer to advance a standard soil sampler. MDD or maximum bearing density is the density of soil or the light of dirt. It has been heated to a temperature of 221 degrees Fahrenheit or 105 degrees Celsius to a dry condition. Shearing strength measures of the ability to resist displacement when an external force is applied due largely to the combined effects of cohesion and internal friction. Water table is the level beneath which the soil is saturated with groundwater. Hello again! So, we discussed uh, about excavation and earthworking. Nanisha, mga process. So, these are the following. Number one is an excavating. The process of digging the earth to provide a place for the foundation of the building. Number two is ang leveling and grading. These are processes that change land elevation and slope by filling in low spots and shaving off high spots. Number three is stabilizing the soil. It is the process of compacting the soil on which the structure will rest. Number four is the protection of adjoining structure. It is a law that provides that any person making an excavation is responsible for resulting damage to adjoining property. And lastly is shoring. It is a process of transferring a portion of the load of the wall to temporary footings and done when the excavation does not go much below the adjoining footings and when the material is fairly solid. So, another is dewatering. It refers to the process of lowering a water table or preventing an excavation from filling the groundwater. It is accomplished by driving perforated tubes called well points into the ground to collect water from the surrounding area so it can be pumped away. Next is we have site drainage. A site drainage is necessary to prevent erosion and collection of excess surface water or groundwater resulting from new construction. What is surface water? Rainfall which runs over the surface of the ground. Water carried by an aggregate except that held by absorption within the aggregate particles themselves. Groundwater. It is the water near the surface of the ground which passes through the subsoil. So what are the basic types of site drainage? First, we have the subsurface drainage. Subsurface drainage. It consists of an underground network of piping for conveying groundwater to a point of disposal as a storm sewer system or natural outfall at a lower elevation on the site. Excess groundwater can reduce the load carrying capacity of a foundation soil and increase the hydrostatic pressure on a building foundation. Waterproofing the is required for basement structures situated close to or below the water table of a site. So you might ask, what are the components of the subsurface drainage system? First, we have the catch basins. Catch basins are receptacles for the runoff of surface water. They have a basin or sump that retains heavy sediment before it can pass into an underground drain pipe. Second, we have the culverts. Culverts are drains or channels passing under a road or walkway. The third one is a foundation drainage tile or pipe. Tile or piping for the collection of subsurface water, dispersion of septic tank effluent, and the like. And the fourth and last one is the drainage tile. The drainage tile is a hollow tile which is usually laid end-to-end -end as piping in soil in order to drain water, saturated soil, or used to permit fluid in the hollow tile pipe to disperse into the ground. So all of those subsurface drainage system components can be seen in the illustration shown in the slide. Surface drainage. Surface drainage refers to the grading and the surfacing of a site in order to divert rain and other surface water into natural drainage patterns or a municipal storm sewer system. Grass and lawn areas are sloped from 1.5% to 10%, while paved parking areas are sloped from 2% to 3%. A holding pond may be necessary when the amount of surface runoff exceeds the capacity of the storm sewer system. In other words, surface drainage is the order, orderly removal of excess water from the surface of land through improved natural channels or constructed ditches and through shaping of the land. And these are the components of the surface drainage system. Swales. 
Swales are shallow, broad, and vegetated channels designed to store and or convey runoff and remove pollutants. They may be used as conveyance structures to pass the runoff the next stage of the treatment train and can be designed to promote infiltration where soil and groundwater conditions are low. Swales are formed by intersection of two ground slopes designed to direct or divert the runoff of surface water. Grass swale slopes has 1.5% to 2%, while pale swales have 4% to 6% slopes. Area drain. Area drain is a receptacle designed to collect surface water or rainwater from an open area. Area drains are designated to collect excess rain and stormwater runoff from roofs, sidewalks, parking lots, and paved streets. Ponds and marshes. Ponds or marshes are designed catchment areas for surface water. Dry wells. Dry wells are drainage pits lined with gravel or rubble to receive surface water and allow it to prelocate away to absorbent earth underground, also called an absorbing well. Absorption field and disposal field. It is a system of trenches containing coarse aggregate and distribution of pipes through which septic tank effluently may seep into the surrounding soil. In other words, it is an area used for the disposal of fluids after being partially treated by a septic tank to be further treated before being added to the water table. Absorption trench. Absor absorption trench is a trench containing courses, aggregate, and distribution tile pipe to which a septic tank effluent may flow, covered with earth. Trenches are usually 500 to 700 mm deep and up to around 600 mm wide. Beds are usually no deeper than 600 mm but up to several meters wide and containing a number of distribution pipes or arches. For slope and protection and retaining structures, first, the need for stabilizing a slope ground can be reduced by diverting the runoff at the top of the slope or by creating a series of terraces to reduce velocity of the runoff. Second, natural means of stabilization include soil binders, plant materials that inhibit or prevent erosion by providing a ground cover and forming a dense network of roots that bind the soil. Third is riprap. Riprap is a layer of irregular broken and random sized stones placed on the slope of embankment. Riprap is a depth of layer be greater than the maximum size of stone and with a filter fabric or graded sand and gravel for drainage. The fourth one is cribbing. It is a cellular framework of square steel, concrete, or timber members assembled in layers at right angles and filled with earth or stones. The fifth is bean wall. It is a type of gravity retaining wall formed by stacking modular, interlocking precast concrete units, and filling the voids with crushed stone or gravel. Structures. When a desired change in ground elevation exceeds the angle of repose of new soil, a retaining wall becomes necessary to hold the mass of earth on the uphill side of the grade change. The types of retaining structures, retaining walls, are as follows. Gravity retaining wall resists overturning and sliding by their sheer weight and volume of its mass. T-type cantilevered retaining wall limited to a height of 20 feet. Beyond this height, a counterfoot wall is employed. Counterfort retaining wall utilizes triangular shaped cross walls to stiffen the vertical slab and add weight to the base. The counterforts are spaced at equal intervals equal to one half and wall height. L-type cantilevered retaining wall used when the wall abuts a property line or other obstruction. Hi! So, nakaabot na kita sa last part. Okay, so, kadayon lang tayo. Kaya pa ni. So, ang last na ko iingon is about pavements. So, pavements or paving provides a wearing surface for pedestrian or vehicle or traffic in the landscape. It is a composite structure whose thickness and construction are directly related to types and intensity of traffic and loads to be carried. And number two, bearing capacity and permeability of the subgrade. So, what are the types of pavements? Number one is flexible pavements. It consists of unit pavers of concrete, brick, or stone laid on a sand setting bed, are somewhat resilient and distribute loads to the subgrade in radiating matter. It requires wood, steel, stone, masonry, or concrete edging to restrain horizontal movement. Here are the types of pavers. Penny first is a brick paver. Number two is a concrete unit paver. Number three, kini, is an interlocking pavers. Mone siya tong usually gagakita sa school or sa mga kind of buildings with tao. Number four is a grid or turf block. Kanisa, napot ni siya sa school. Number five is a granite cobble. And lastly, is a cut stone. So now that we already discussed the definition of paving, paving and the types of pavements, let's familiarize ourselves more by discussing the paving patterns and details. So, naturally, unit running bond, stock bond, unit basket weave, interlocking basket weave, octagon and dot, Roman cobble, horse usher, unit herringbone, interlocking herringbone, 
interlocking basketry, turf block, and random stone. So muna sila ang mga paving patterns. So let us proceed sa ilahang paving details. First, flexible base. So sa first part, naa siya unit pavers with hand-tight sand-swept joints. Second layer niya, naa siya 1 to 2 inch sand setting bed. And sa so, yung katalong layer is naa compacted aggregate. Well, three, two to six inches of compacted aggregate were required in high traffic areas or over expansive soil. And lastly, nasi compacted subgrade or undisturbed soil. Sa iyang edge de edging detail code, nasi paving unit on mortar bed set on edge or laid flat, and concrete footing provide and concrete footing provide gravel underfooting if frost depth is deeper than the footing. Next is the rig rigid base. Sa first layer niya, sa first part niya is nasi brick or concrete pavers. And next is three to four, a three four inch bituminous setting bed, and four to six inches na concrete slab, and lastly na compacted aggregate if required. Tapos sa edging pod, sa edging part is na si paving unit set vertically or mortar bed. Unit may extend up to one half or paver height to form curve, and na si concrete footing. And lastly, turf paver. So sa turf paver, na si turf block, topsoil mix for grass or ground cover, two inches and setting bed and two to six inches na compacted aggregate. And sa iyang edge pod, nasa pressure treated wood edge or curb, two inches layer of wood chips, crushed stone or pea gravel, two, two inch base of soil cement mixture or crushed stone. And lastly, two by two or two by four pressure treated wood shakes. So that's all for the pavement. Thank you.